Now I'm talking to Stephen Gilbo, Canada's Minister of, of Environment and Climate Change. Mr. Gilbo, you're often talking about science, keeping 1.5 in reach. At the same time, your country, Canada, is the fourth largest yeah. oil producing country in the world. How do you explain this gap between ambition and action? Well, the fact that we are the fourth largest oil and gas producer is just a reality. And, but it does mean we have, uh, as a country, perhaps a greater responsibility to do more when it comes to, to, to fighting climate change. And the way we're doing that is by putting in place more and more measures to ensure that we tackle the climate change issue in Canada. We've announced clean electricity regulations so that our electricity grid is carbon neutral by 2035. We announced the world's most ambitious methane targets for the oil and gas sector. And, we, and, and on top of that, I also announced that we would be capping the emissions of the oil and gas sector so that those emissions go down over time so we can achieve our 2030 and 2050 targets. Before you've been in favor of a coal phase out, now the big talk here is a fossil fuel phase out. Mm -hmm. Are you behind this goal to also phase out long term uh, coal, oil and gas all combined? So on coal, Canada has been very supportive. We all already have legislation in Canada to be out of coal by 2030. Frankly, I think we will get there even sooner than that. And now, you're right, there is a more broader conversation here on some phase out of, of fossil fuels. Um, we don't know exactly what the language is, but we've been talking with a number of delegations. We're very favorable to that. It, we need to reduce our dependencies on fossil fuels. We can't solve climate change if we don't do that. It's not enough to do more renewables. It's not enough to do more electric vehicles or electric trans public transit. We need to reduce our dependencies on fossil fuels. And I don't know exactly what the text will be, but I think that for the first time in the history of the negotiation, so my first COP was COP1 in Berlin in 1995, and we've never been able to talk about fossil fuels. We've never agreed together that, that we needed to tackle this issue of fossil fuels. And I, I suspect that the language may not be perfect for some, but I'm almost convinced we will have something here for the first time in almost 30 years of climate change negotiations. Developing countries are asking for different timelines, for differentiation between responsibilities for industrial countries, also as Canada, as Canada for example. Um, is that something that you could accept, them uh, phasing out, phasing down later, and you as Canada, but also EU and, and Germany moving first? Would that be something that is acceptable for you? I'm I recognize that countries like Canada and Germany have a greater responsibility. We have been large emitters and certainly on a per capita, even in absolute term, I mean, there's only 40 million Canadians, yet we're the top 10, we're amongst the top 10, maybe top 11 now, overall emitters of greenhouse gas as a nation. So we have a very big responsibility. And we recognize that we need to support developing countries. I, I, I am a bit um, worried that about the differentiation on, on fossil fuels with, with developing countries because the science is clear. I mean, if we want to keep 1.5 within reach, we all have to reduce our dependencies on, on fossil fuels. So even if Canada and Germany and Europe were to stop all of our production of fossil fuels, if countries in the south increase theirs, the atmosphere doesn't see any difference. I mean, it doesn't matter for the atmosphere where the emissions are coming from. What, what matters is how much. But what, what, what I think is important is how can we support developing countries so that they have energy security, so that they have energy for, for all of their people. And, 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 and we do this in a, in a just transition manner for, for their communities, for their workers. And we recognize that for that to happen, countries like mine and yours need to provide more support for the Global South. Uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, Saudi Arabia block blocking the process, Gulf states, we saw the letter from, from OPEC. How to convince these countries, which have a huge dependency, even bigger than Canada, for example, on, on, on oil, to, to phase out, to agree to this? This is a question everybody is asking themselves, like, what could motivate them and how do you work with them to get them on the side of, 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 of climate protection? It's interesting. Um, I was reading a report that says that here in the UAE, oil and gas is slowing down economic growth. So if we were to remove oil and gas from, from the portfolio of, of the UAE, their economic growth would be, would be faster because they're diversifying their economy. 
And the reality is that many Gulf states are doing that. Saudi Arabia is doing that. They're investing in renewables. They're investing in clean technologies. They're probably one of the largest, the world's largest investor in these technologies now. But I think there is a fear. There is a uh, concern uh, and fear of the unknown. And I think... It, I mean, Canada is very well placed as a large oil and gas producer to talk with these people and to say, well, we are doing this transition in Canada. It's not easy. Uh, it's not, oh, when I announced a cap on, on, on emissions for the oil and gas sector, many people in my parliament were calling for my resignation. Uh, so it, it is difficult, but it is nonetheless necessary. And we are trying to reach out to some of these countries and say, can we work together on these things? I, I, I don't pretend I have all the answers, but we are trying to make that transition in Canada. It is difficult. Maybe we can work together and learn from each other's experience. Mm -hmm. um, a commentator said uh, a couple of days before uh, ago that Canada wants to promote fossil fuel phase out in the long term, but also wants to protect its own industry or make its own oil and gas industry happy. Uh, lately, lately, you announced, or you already mentioned, the emissions, uh, the emissions cap to oil and gas. Uh, industry, does that really lead to less oil and gas being burned in the future? So uh, my job is not to make the oil and gas uh, companies happy in Canada and clearly they're not happy with me. That's not part of, that's not what the Prime Minister of Canada has asked me to do. Uh, the, in, in Canada we have a, an added challenge that the federal government constitutionally does not control the use of natural resources. Our constitution specifies that it's our, our subnational governments, our provinces, who have control over natural resources. So I can't, I can't say, you know, cut your production of, of oil and gas, but where our constitution says I can't act is on pollution, CO2, methane, and, and other greenhouse gases, and that's exactly what we're doing. What we want to do in Canada is, I mean, we know that the Product, the consumption of fossil fuels is going to go down. We're electrifying our transportation system, we're electrifying our grid, we're electrifying our heavy industries. So there's no doubt that the consumption and therefore the production of fossil fuels will go down. And that's why we need to work on a just transition. It's going to happen in Canada. We, we're producing about 5% of the world's oil right now. Um, in 2050, we won't be producing, or if we're producing 5% of the oil, it's going to be 5% of a much smaller pie. So we, we have to prepare for that, and that's exactly what we're doing. In fact, we've introduced in our parliament uh, a bill on just transition because we recognize we need to, to be there for workers and communities who are right now dependent on oil and gas and who in 10 years, 15 years, will not be able to depend on that anymore. Last year, no, 2021 or last year, you provided uh, 13 billion dollars in subsidies to the sector. How do you explain that with your targets to reduce the emissions and to reduce the sector's imp uh, footprint? So in 2009 at the G20 in Pittsburgh, uh, countries agreed to phase out their fossil fuel subsidies. Um, and unfortunately, very few countries have made progress on that. Canada is the first country in the G20 to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies and we did so in 2023 and the target is for 2025 and we're inviting on we're inviting all other G20 members to do the same thing we've made a commitment not only insufficient subsidies all subsidies you're talking about so subsidies that are directed at the oil and gas sector so we still have subsidies for decarbonization that are available for all sectors whether it's steel cement um, electricity production and and oil and gas but there, these subsidies are not designed to help produce more, more, more fossil fuels. They're, they're there to help decarbonize those, those sectors. And, and if the fourth largest oil and gas producer in the world can eliminate their, their fossil fuel subsidies, I think everyone can. Mm -hmm. and, and we're encouraging others to do, to, do, to do the same. Coming to climate finance, you were very active um, ahead of COP in the past years. Uh, together with Germany to raise the, to really increase and get to the 100 billion dollar uh, target. Um, now it's uh, it's reached very probably. Um, nevertheless, when the when the loss and damage fund came up, which is a great success, um, Canada pledged eight, uh, 11 million. 16. No, 16, 16 million. 16. Sorry, I correct myself. Not really much. Well, I think it's not the end of our contribution, and, and we've made uh, we've made we've doubled our, our, our contribution this year to the Green Climate Fund, for example. So I think we we are um, 
doing more efforts when, when it comes to supporting the South, whether it's on, on, on nature. We were the first contributors to the new Global Biodiversity Fund that was announced last summer in Vancouver at the Global Environmental Facilities Assembly. We, and and for, for loss and damage specifically, it's, it's $16 million. I mean, if you look at the, the Americans also put $16 million and they're 10 times bigger than Canada. But it's not the, the last contribution we'll make, but it, but it was important for us to make um, rapid contribution so that the fund can be operationalized as rapidly as possible. A side topic here, not really prominent, is nature protection. Canada is planning to uh, implement a legal a responsibility yeah. to the state to protect nature, uh, which is kind of unique. Is this, um, yeah, how does this contribute to, to climate action and should this be more prominent in future climate conference according to you? I would actually say that this is probably the climate change conference where, where we've spoken the most about nature and, and the fact that we had an historic agreement in Montreal last year, it helps. Uh, the presidency, the UAE presidency has been very open to, to, to make sure that the linkages between climate and nature are very present here, whether it's in the negotiating text, whether it's dedicated in a day here to oceans, nature, uh, two days ago. And yes, we, we are one of the first countries to commit to putting into our national laws our, our, our global biodiversity framework targets, but I'm, I'm confident that others will because we know that the best, our best ally to fight climate change is nature, whether it's to sequester carbon, whether it's to whether it's to help our, our, our cities be less face, face less to the, the impacts of, of heating, um, whether it is by increasing the, the, the protection and restoration of, of nature. And we, we, we are working with countries from all around the world, whether it's China, whether it's uh, Brazil, whether it's countries in, in Africa and Southeast Asia and, and other developed nations to ensure that we implement as rapidly as possible the COP15 targets that we agreed to last year. Last question, if there would be a tax on fossil fuel phase out here, do you think it will make history and are we making history uh, at this COP in Dubai? Absolutely. I, I, as I was saying earlier, in almost 30 years of negotiations, we've never been able to say in a text fossil fuels. Um, so I, I'm confident that we will agree on something. It probably won't be perfect. It rarely is. But it will be an historic moment that we are able to do that for the first time. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much.